Hello, and thank you so much for joining. My name is Anne Alexander, and I'm the editor of Mindful Magazine, and I am super thrilled to be kicking off this first Mindful Action Twitter chat. Today, we're gonna to be talking about adapting to the new normal. I'm here with neuroscientist Dr. Amishi Jha, Congressman Tim Ryan, Lieutenant General Walter Pyatt, and we invite everyone on Twitter to participate. Just use the hashtag, MyNewNormal. So let's get started with some quick introductions. Dr. Amishi Jha is a neuroscientist at the University of Miami. She researches the effects of mindfulness on the brain, especially under extreme stress. She's also a practitioner of mindfulness. Welcome, Dr. Jha. Thank Congressman you. Congressman Ryan is also with us from the beautiful state of Ohio. Um, he is the author of Healing America and a practitioner of mindfulness. This Twitter chat was your idea. Congressman Ryan, thank you so much for suggesting it and welcome. Um, and finally, we have General Walter Pyatt, three-star general, director of the U.S. Army. General Pyatt joins us from the Pentagon, as you can see by those beautiful flags behind him. General Pyatt is also a practitioner of mindfulness. Hello and welcome, General Pyatt. Hi there. So let's get started. You guys have all very different day jobs. But the thing that brings us together is mindfulness like a complete respect and appreciation for all the wonderful things that mindfulness can do for our mental health, especially under extreme stress. So that sounds a lot like our new normal. So let's just get started with some questions. Congressman Ryan, you are so good at having a heart for listening and connecting with people. What are you hearing about people and how they're adapting to this new normal? Well, I appreciate it, and I, I want to thank all of you at Mindful for, for organizing this and allowing us to use your platform. Uh, I remember when the magazine first started and then the online thing took course, and we, I just want to thank you all for being uh, leaders in this area. And I, I think people are still trying to figure it out, to be quite honest with you. Everybody's really, it's amazing, everybody's kind of in a different slot. Uh, you have these frontline workers um, that are in the middle of it. I mean, they're on a COVID floor in a hospital that's overwhelmed. You have people working at grocery stores who are, you know, check out cashiers and, you know, getting coughed on and everything else. They're in the front lines. People are in that food ecosystem making sure we get our food. And then you have teachers and kids that aren't even in school. And so they're home. And many of us are working from home now. And you have parents who are trying to educate their kids and teachers who are trying to do digital learning and college kids that are home with their parents again. So you can run the gamut of, of the complexities of where people are today. But underneath all that, I think as we all are acknowledging, which is why we're doing this, is a significant increase in anxiety, stress, uncertainty, all of these things that, that a practice like mindfulness can help you deal with, which is why it's a, in a universal way can be universally helpful. Absolutely. So, you know, talking about the anxiety, the uncertainty, the stress, that's the perfect lead in to asking Dr. Ja. Now, you're a neuroscientist, so this is what you study. You study the brain and you study the effects of mindfulness and how we react to all of this kind of stress. So can you tell us a little bit about like what is happening to our brains during this kind of prolonged period of high stress? Yeah, so in my lab at the University of Miami, we study the brain's attention system. And this system is obviously so important for every single thing we do. Our ability to focus, notice, plan, make decisions, take action, and even regulate our mood, we need it. And it ends up that things like Tim mentioned, uncertainty, ambiguity, fear, threat, these things hijack the attention system so that we're no longer in the present moment, so that we're mentally time traveling. Uh, in our case, probably to the past, just a few months ago when things were quite different, maybe looking back fondly, being able to just go anywhere you want, or probably more common these days, at least for me, is fast forwarding to all the uncertainty about the future. And in doing this, in this mental time travel, uh, we compromise attention and we can't use it quite as well which means we end up with this sort of collective cognitive fog, which I feel, I feel it in my students, I feel it in myself. And it makes it very hard to feel like we have our normal capacities to, to deal with a challenging situation. 
So the brain fog really then is real. Oh yeah. I mean, we measure it when we look at people like soldiers and even students over the academic semester. These are real effects of, of decline in our ability to pay attention and, and in our mood over high stress intervals. Right. So how does mindfulness help? Like if we're in this sort of crazy, chaotic space and we're feeling brain fog, how does mindfulness help deal with that? Well, that's one of the things we've been trying to understand. That's why it's so exciting to bring practices that are mindfulness practices into a laboratory, because we can apply all the tools of neuroscience that we have access to, to studying this. And it goes back to what I was saying before. If attention is so powerful and it's so easily hijacked, can we measure that? Can we measure that in the way that the brain actually functions? Can we measure that in people's performance? And when we think about mindfulness, what we really are doing, at least from my point of view as an attention researcher, is that we're training attention to be more steady and to be in the present so that when that kind of mental time travel just happens to us, we're more aware that we've landed in future worry or ruminating about the past and we can bring it back to being in the here and the now. And through that, we can actually harness the capacity of our attention back so we're not so lost in thought. Gotcha. Right. I love how you're describing it as time travel. So you're you're either ruminating about the past or worrying about the future. And right now, our future is so uncertain. Um, there's a lot to worry about. So mindfulness sounds like it's you know extra extra important. Um, General Pyatt, let me ask you. You know, you and and um, Dr. Jha have worked together for a long time, and you know, you have helped introduce mindfulness into training for troops, especially pre-deployment um, training. And you and Dr. Jaw worked together on that. When did you like first realize that mindfulness could be a powerful tool? When I first heard Dr. Jaw talk, when she first described <laughs> what soldiers would go through and what people experience during high stress, and I immediately clicked, said, uh, one, she gets it. And two, there's some science here that we can follow. And immediately I knew there was an application because it, it, at the outbreak of this crisis, I, I texted Amishi and I said, it's times like these, why we practice? Uh, because when stress is at its greatest, I mean, these are, this is a horrible times. So, I mean, three, almost 300,000 people have lost their lives to this virus, over 83,000 Americans. Uh, you know, this is not the time that we can succumb to stress and, and panic and fear. I mean, we, we have to, accept it and, and mindfulness allows you to accept it no matter how bad it is first to accept it and i think the most powerful tool we can have in solving and addressing this terrible crisis is to listen is to simply listen and to have that ability to pay attention and to see how bad this uh, crisis is and to listen to others and by listening we're finding solutions uh, not, not just the military, I mean, everyone all over the world. Uh, so I think uh, this demonstrates the importance of mindfulness uh, for, for the military and for all our leaders and for all our first responders, because they have to deal with a harsh, deadly environment every day. They don't get the option uh, not to go. They, they have to go. And I think the first thing is to, one, accept it, uh, understand that environment and, and listen. And then with compassion and empathy, we can lead towards solutions. Right. Well, what about, I hear what you're saying about listening and, and hearing and listening for solutions and, and being, you know, really attuned to the, to the situation. What about like now where, you know, the, the quote unquote enemy is invisible and there's absolutely no playbook. You know, you've got troops who you were training for combat and they're helping at nursing homes, or they're helping with you know more trades. Like, what do you do when there's there's absolutely no roadmap? So it's not like you could go and listen to somebody and say, hey, what do you think, or what should we do? It's like there is absolutely no, there's no playbook for this. What do you what do you do then? Well, in in the military, and I think in many professions, uh, understanding the environment is always key, and sometimes the environment can be more deadly than an adversary. Uh, whether it's harsh uh, cold winter conditions or hot uh, tropical climate conditions, the environment always gets a vote and you have to be able to operate, live, accept and move within an environment in order to be able to accomplish your mission. So it's not a strange concept to us. 
this virus though however it's not although it can't be seen with the naked eye it's not a a free thinking adaptable enemy that you might face and so there is the predictability that the science allows so immediately you know we we did but i think what everybody did study the flu epidemic in, in 1918 and, and realized what did people do they they acted early without complete information and that's what leaders in the pentagon had to do and leaders all over the all over our nation all over the world but we had to make decisions without not not without complete information really with no information uh we watched the virus uh you know, erupt in China and, and you felt compassion for what the people were going through. People assumed it was going to be a global pandemic. It was going to come to the United States just the way global travel is these days. But what would what could the military do? And what we did uh, was make decisions early. They were unpopular in the military circles, but they proved to be the right choice. We we were scheduled to do big exercises all over the world with with critical uh, units that were going to be needed and we just made a decision you know what if our nation uh, needs these military assets we don't want them to be in europe uh, in quarantine and we don't want to be them somewhere in asia training or exercising when our nation's going to need them so we we canceled exercises and it was very unpopular at the time it seems you know brilliant now uh, but it was very unpopular so i, I think that awareness and acceptance that it, it allows uh, leaders to make decisions without information uh, when they're unpopular, uh, regardless that they're doing it for a greater good. And then it proved decisive because our our military hospital centers were immediately deployed first to Washington and then to New York City. And they, they proved vital in helping the first responders there and added much needed medical care and, and ICU care for COVID patients. Right, right. Gosh, so now at this point, this that seems like you know, half a year ago. It seems like we've moved into like a whole nother decade and you're right. In retrospect, it sounds brilliant, but the ability to to lead, you know, in these sort of changing times and as you said, I, I, you know, lack of complete information. And I love your description of the environment gets a vote. That's, that's really interesting. Well, talking about, you know, dealing with unpredictable or difficult situations, Congressman Ryan, you know, you're making decisions all the time that are you know similarly in some ways you know affecting hundreds of thousands of people people's livelihoods people's health um you know and that i imagine takes a lot of clear-sightedness that takes courage um how do you perhaps maybe use mindfulness but how do you filter out all the the noise or decide what's a priority you know and get to what really matters to people yeah I don't. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, you know, you, the, the the noise levels they they get so loud. But you you do. There are you know there are moments you win and moments you lose, and and sometimes uh, that noise wins out. Uh, but that's why it's a practice um, that you you have to continue to work and fight and 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 try to get back to that 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 present moment uh, where there is more clarity. Uh, and hopefully you've had enough time to get there before you have to, you know, make decisions. I have the luxury of having a little bit more time than someone like General uh, Piat does or people, you know, troops on the ground where it's instantaneous, where you have to make a decision. Um, but what I've found is that, you know, especially in times like this, that really having clarity as to one, what's the truth? And, and two, what is the solution as you see it? And sometimes, as the general said, sometimes, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, sometimes you call it right, sometimes you don't. But you, you, I would much rather be in a position where to think, look, I, was, I, I looked at things clearly, I saw what the truth was, and then I based my response on what I felt was the best answer. And we're doing that all the time now, especially on, on the public health side, but also on the economic side, um, because this is in, the, in, the, in the, talking about the truth. And I, I want to make sure I emphasize this. Like if I had one critique and I have several, but if I had one critique in the country right now, it would be I don't think we are honestly preparing the American people for the depth and the length and the severity that this country is going to go through in the coming months economically. We just found out today that 40 percent of people who make less than $40,000 a year lost their job in March, 
You know, unemployment rates at 35 million people. Uh, and, and so this is going to go on for a while. And so approaching it in a way to say, look, this is going to be a long slog. We've got to hang together and, and we've got to put forward policies that are going to try to stabilize things and move us forward. And then lastly, and I think almost in some ways most importantly, is how do you how do you turn lemons into lemonade? What are the shifts that are going to happen in the country right now that we could actually take advantage of? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it, Trunk Rinpoche used to say, uh, at least I read it, never heard him say it, but I read it multiple times and I have it hanging in my office in Washington, D.C., that out of chaos comes creativity. And so what whether we're talking about telework, telemedicine, the importance of trauma informed care for our kids who already were traumatized, but now here we are even more our frontline workers, like, are we just going to say, oh, here's a couple extra thousand bucks in hazard pay, which I'm for them getting, or are we really going to help them learn how to deal with with trauma? Uh, what are we going to do uh, with the digital divide that we're seeing right. r- literally get exposed before our very eyes? Kids have to go home to learn, but they don't have computers or access to broadband. So the point is, mm-hmm. deal with things as they are, but then try to find that the opportunity that lies within that chaos, within the, the suffering, to actually bring about some really transformational change. And I hope that we, in some ways, this is the crash kind of way of saying it, but I hope we take advantage of what's happening here to make these shifts that I think we've been wanting to make as a country for a long time, bringing a lot of social justice. I mean, my wife's a teacher, and she's getting, this is just one example, but she's getting text messages from parents and others, and her colleagues are as well. Thank you so much for what you do, right? You don't get paid enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a new appreciation for teachers now because parents are home having to teach their own kids. And they're like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, and my wife tells me all the time, I could never do your job. And I'm like, listen, you're a first grade school teacher. I could never do yours. But I, I don't think anybody can walk through the grocery store again and, and without some level of appreciation for the cashier that's there, I don't think you can see a nurse, police, fire, you know, all of uh, nursing home workers, hospice work. I mean, all of these people that are out there now. So how do we recreate the culture out of this thing? And, and to me, if you're seeing things clearly, you're also seeing the opportunities for deeper shifts. And I hope I hope we take advantage of that. Yeah, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I think that your emphasis on seeing things clearly and seeing the truth, even when the truth isn't isn't what you necessarily want to see. I mean, that sounds like both you and General Pyatt are talking about the same thing. You know, it reminds me of a phrase. I don't know if I've heard General Pyatt say it, but I, I, it sounds like an army type phrase, which is embrace the suck, which sounds <laughs> you know, like a crafty request, like a way of which is different from suck it up, because embrace the suck is saying it, it's not great right now. I mean, there are tremendous inequities that are being revealed every day. I mean, you know, parents, I'm, I'm a parent with three teenagers, and it's easy for me to complain because I've got, you know, kids and teaching them and helping them. But for the other kids who don't have access to a computer, you know, who've just disappeared off the grid, I mean, we, there are, there are tremendous opportunities here, and the the importance of addressing them couldn't be more couldn't be more obvious. Yeah. Um, let me talk a little. Let me let me segue. Perhaps you know we've talked a little bit about mindfulness and how important it is um, for po- folks that may be listening who maybe don't have a practice yet or kind of think, well, mindfulness involves sitting on the floor in a lotus position or you know meditating off on a mountain top. I'm going to ask General Pyatt. Could you show us a little bit of what mindfulness actually is? Um, don't mean to put you on the spot. But just... <laughs> I'm glad you did. <laughs> I would say as the lowest ranking person of this four, uh, I guess it's coming to me. Uh, I am not least, I'm the least qualified of this four, but, but I, I, and I'm not a mindfulness instructor. So I would say that up front, but I would, I, I would say that in the Pentagon, I got several tricks. So if I can't instruct you, I can at least share if you if you don't mind that. So today I, I, I read out loud Rumi every day. I read something from there's a book that Amishi gave me before my last um, 
deployment to Iraq. And I find just a short focus of just a verse or two helps me. And today I, I read on body intelligence about how your intelligence is always with you overseeing your body, even though you may not be aware of its work. And I thought that was very telling, especially for the session today. And I do a mindful walk because I'm I, in layman terms. I think people do think you have to be on top of a mountain. I do a mindfulness walk in the um, courtyard of the Pentagon. Sometimes people see the general staring at trees. They think he's <laughs> maybe lost it or something. Uh, but but it really helps me. And then and then so I also have what I call my mindful uh, Pentagon breathing practice that I do. And I'd like to share that with you and have have the folks uh, join with me. And it just you just need a chair. Imagine that. And so you just need a firm chair. And we have lots of chairs in the Pentagon. So I like to say the Pentagon is mindful ready. So those of you who ever <laughs> doubted it. So if you find your chair and you just I just sit up straight and I do this several times a day just for a few minutes, maybe five, but we'll just do a few. And I just put my feet firmly on the ground and, and I just rid the stress from my body immediately. But I feel my legs on the chair and and my small of my back and the back of the chair and I put my arms on my thighs and you can keep your eyes open or, or you can shut them. And then it's just really settling in the chair, let going of all the tension and just breathing in and breathing out. Not forcing the air, not keeping a cadence, just breathing in and focusing on the air that you're breathing in. Breathing out. And it's always this time my mind wanders off to the thousand emails I'm getting and I bring it back and I just focus on breathing in and breathing out. And I can feel my chest grow as I breathe in air and I can feel the temperature of the air as it comes in. And I feel the air going out. And the more I do this, my mind wanders off to some other thought and I just gently bring it back to breathing in and breathing out. It doesn't matter how often your mind wanders off, just gently bring it back and just focus on your breath. And I gently just come back to my body and just feel myself sitting again in the chair and open my eyes and get ready to get back on to work. So, but I'll also have my meditation bowl that I ring to remind me that it's time to go back to school almost. <laughs> so I work that in maybe three, four times a day. Uh, that's maybe not normal or what's prescribed, but I, I, with the time that we have, I find that uh, by thinking about nothing, I can think a lot about the things I have to do next. And it just brings my attention more clear while working in, in, in the Pentagon. So those are Pentagon secrets. Those are all classified. I will, <laughs> I will, I will either deny or, or admit that I know about this, but uh, I'm sure Mishi will publish it somewhere. Uh, but th thanks. I, uh, again, I'm not an instructor and I apologize to anyone out there who is that says this man needs needs a lesson in instructing. I, 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 I am not that. Oh, no, I think that clearly your your general training shows through because I was going right along with you. That was that was beautiful. And just, you know, having I've been practicing mindfulness for a long time, but it never ceases to amaze me sort of the before and the after. You know, that just that beautiful feeling of just like sort of a momentary kind of equanimity. And it's just, it's just, it's a lovely before and after. So thank you for that. Dr. Ja, could you explain a little bit about why is that such just 
so healing and so relaxing. Like, what is going on up there that just allows us to feel so at peace so quickly? I think, well, first of all, congratulations. That was awesome. Nicely led practice, sir. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I think that what I, what I loved about that practice was that it kind of hits all the important aspects of something that actually a general Pyatt coined the term, you know, a push up for the mind. Um, we had something to focus on. We were noticing what was going on when the mind wandered, we redirected it back. So this capacity to focus, notice, redirect is, is sort of the elements of the push up. Now, if you had, if you did that practice and you felt peace, that's wonderful, but that's certainly not a requirement of doing the practice. And if I'm sure if we ask a general pilot, there's probably been many times. In fact, I remember him uh, practicing or describing practicing when he was deployed the last time. And the experience sometimes is not peaceful. Sometimes it's showing up to what's in the mind that isn't peaceful at all. Right. And I would say that's been the nature of my practice lately. It's been um, being very aware and being with and befriending my own anxiety, uncertainty, worry. And there's something that comes from just being with that, not pushing it away, not trying to transform it, not even trying to look for silver linings, just an accepting orientation toward our experience. And I actually think that's a critical ingredient to distress tolerance. And I think that with more distress tolerance, we have greater capacity for clarity. Um, and that's what we need in order to do the kind of thing that, that Congressman Ryan was talking about. To be able to see in the moment when there is a lot of fog and confusion happening of what the opportunities are to best benefit those we care about and those in our communities requires clarity, especially from our leaders. And that's why I was so thrilled to have both of them here uh, because it, if anybody needs these practices, we want our leaders to have them. We want them to have their full capacity to make compassionate choices that will hopefully, you know, beneficially impact all of us. Right. That is so true. Clarity and compassion. And and let's let's switch gears to compassion for a sec. But I just want to say, if anybody is tuning in right now, I just want to say I'm Alexander. I'm the editor of Mindful. You are joining a live Twitter chat on adapting to the new normal. We have Dr. Anishi Jha, we have Congressman Tim Ryan, and we have General Walter Paya. So let's talk about compassion because mindfulness and compassion are like two sides of the same coin. They're just, they're interwoven. And as coronavirus has unfolded around the globe, we have seen these magnificent examples of compassion, of kindness, of people you know, really just being so generous neighbor to neighbor, frontline workers. Congressman Ryan, as you mentioned, you know, the grocery store workers who we have such a greater sense of, of solidarity and gratefulness for. Um, so Congressman Ryan, you know, when you talked in your book um, about seeing the good in people, and you saw that a lot, you described seeing that a lot after 9-11, are you seeing that same spirit today? And how do we, how do we keep that going? Well, that's the culture shift, I think, that, that we're all, I think, striving for in some way. I mean, you're, you're seeing it in all kinds of different ways. You can see, you know, gruff business uh, people convert their uh, little machine shop over to making masks or goggles and things like that and not charging. We've had a, a local person here do that and make thousands of them for, you know, frontline healthcare workers. Uh, we got a text last week from one of our neighbors saying, hey, friend of mine's doing X, Y, and Z to try to get food uh, to some people who really need it. Uh, and before you know it, you could look out the window and, and see people carrying boxes within hours down down their house to put on the front porch. Um, churches are, are doing, you know, free meals that they're passing out. Um, local restaurants who aren't making a, any money at all uh, are, are serving meals uh, to try to help out so you're you're seeing it in in a lot of different ways and again i i just it, for us to 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 really try to have that deep shift of appreciation respect for people that you know three months ago we walked right by and didn't even notice um and again it's the noticing it's the awareness so yeah a mindfulness practice can help you raise your awareness but events tragedies 
you know, uh, emotional shifts, all these can, can happen, uh, to allow that to happen too. So th that's really my, my hope. Uh, but you're seeing it everywhere. I'm sure you all are in your own little neighborhoods and, and families. Um, and again, you know, there's a lot of people who we are talking just about the education piece. And I hope because when you keep, when you're in my business uh, or maybe in, in the general's business too, like you try to take a value like compassion and then you figure out how to, how to get it pushed down through the organization or pushed down through uh, society. And, you know, what we've seen, just like with education, just to not harp on it, but, you know, our six-year-old is home with my wife, right? So there are some kids that go home and their parents are working and they're not getting their schoolwork done. They're falling behind and behind and behind and behind, throwing the digital divide, right? And then my son uh, is going to be six years old. His mom is home every day as a sixth grade uh, or a first grade school teacher. So he's doing flashcards. He's reading books. He's doing puzzles. He knows he's learning about the presidents because we have a pe presidential puzzle. Um, and, and so he's accelerating past where he would probably normally be in school and other kids are falling behind. So why do I bring this up when you're talking about compassion? Like if we want to just take appreciation, walking through the grocery line, talking to a, a, a clerk and appreciating that, that's one thing. But what's the big national a, a value or initiative that's actually going to show compassion for those kids. Are we going to put resources behind closing the digital divide, making sure that his the kid has a computer, make sure we are paying teachers more, make sure there's more one-on-one -on -one for those kids. So how do you convert in society compassion into actual initiatives? And I'm not saying it's all government or no government. I don't even want to get in that dumb fight, but it's just how do we translate the value into the society, the organization, or whatever, in order to really make it stick? It's a, that is the million dollar question, or with inflation, that must be like now the trillion dollar question, <laughs> is, how, you know, is how do we do that? You know, because well, this, I, if I can, uh, please, I, well, I think it starts by slowing down. Right. You know, I mean, the appreciation that had developed is because we have time to s stop and look. I mean, you know, uh, we came down to go grocery shopping a couple weeks ago. My wife done her, did her hair and had lipstick on because we hadn't been out of the house, you know, like we were going to dinner. And 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 so but it was because we were out. So we're like, oh, my God, that person has a mask on. That one doesn't. This poor worker. Oh, my God, they're working here and these people don't have masks on. And so we've slowed down enough, which is why I think there's an opportunity here. Because until you slow down, you're not going to see, you know, because we're, we were all on the treadmill and now we're not on the treadmill. There's a lot of tragedy and there's a lot of pain and suffering and anxiety, and, but we're not on the treadmill right now. So how do we figure out an opportunity really to, to bring that compassion to bear, to think about things a little bit differently, play the game differently? Um, that's going to be, I think up to our leaders too, to, to, to create that, that culture that they always do in an organization, a church, uh, or any, or a society, the leaders define where you're focusing. And, uh, that's why it's really critical. And this country has benefited over the years from having, you know, the kind of leadership that would transform things. You can go back American revolution, civil war, women's rights, uh, you know, civil rights all through. We had leaders that would help us do that, and that's important for us now. That's you're you're absolutely right, and it's it's what you're saying is also reminding me of the leader we have in our midst um, with General Pyatt, because you've said something, General Pyatt, which is you know so wonderfully revolutionary. See, you know, from somebody in your position, which is to say that compassion is stronger than bullets. You know, that's a that's a really that's a showstopper of a statement, particularly coming from a three star general. I'm just going to say it again and again, who's you know, director of the U.S. Army. I mean, that's a powerful statement. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. And also, we had a question from the Twitter sphere from a woman named Michelle, who tweets according to the, the who tweets as Pearl Dragon Fire. Um, She's a civilian social worker who's developing wellness programs and providing short-term interventions for military members. She asks, how do you improve participation in mindfulness and other self-care activities such as practicing gratitude 
with military members? Because it sounds, I mean, is compassion a tough sell? Especially when, you know, you're sort of a, a macho doodly culture. And sort of, you know, what Congressman Ryan was talking about, of like making this shift. How do we, I mean, you're a role model. How are you being so effective and how else can others be effective? Well, I did, I did say compassion is more powerful than bullets. I was on a deployment in Afghanistan at the time because, you know, war is probably humankind's worst, or it is worst creation of all. But it takes an understanding people to connect in order to to at least bring some type of peace and save lives from such terrible tragedy. So compassion is more powerful than bullets and it has a place in war because it is about the, the people you're trying to protect or trying to bring a better life to. Uh, you can't just fight your way to, to peace. It's, it's not possible. Uh, but compassion now, I think, is the guiding a, a guiding principle for us. Like, as the congressman said, everyone is doing their part. You know, I, you know, I wash my hands probably 50 times a day in the Pentagon, and every time I do, I think of the person who put the soap in the dispenser. It's how important that that person is to this mission right now. It's, you're, you're aware of so many little things that you may have just walked past before. So I think the c- compassion, I think, of allowing us to, to guide us, it makes you proud when you see it, it makes you proud to be a human. And and I think that that's, that's, that's what I feel now when I watch the response of, of our own nation. That's what soldiers feel now when they're able to respond to assist their own citizens. Because often we're not, we're not called to assist unless it's a natural disaster. You know, we're normally sent overseas or something, but to be called upon to help our own country, uh, everyone was willing to do it. There was no shortage of volunteers willing to go anywhere especially to help our own. So I, I, I think it's, it's natural in, uh, in the United States Army uh, because we come from hometowns all across our great nation and we bring with into the military the values we learned as children growing up in small towns like Youngstown, Ohio or somewhere in the middle. You just grow up that way and you come into the Army and you bring that diversity and that respect uh, for human life and that respect uh for your your elders and 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 you bring that to bear as a soldier we don't create the values of a soldier they come to us with that and 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 those values have a place in military operations and we lead often with compassion and understanding and values because that will allow you to be present and to see the environment for what it really is not what you you are training to be it's never what you expect and if you're if you're not uh able to be attention and be in that moment, you're going to react instead of to be thoughtful and discern. And so I think it's always there. It's a power that drives us. And I think what we're, what our nation is seeing and feeling now, despite all the devastation, despite all the sadness, despite all the criticism of the bad decisions, we're seeing that compassion uh, is really the guiding principle uh, that makes us human and that, that will bring us through this crisis a better, better race and a better country. That's compassion and and absolutely and also courage, you know, because it's it's one thing to see the need or to feel and observe and see what needs to be done and to feel the compassion for our community, our fellow citizens, and then to have the courage to act, to make the decisions that need to be done and to actually do um, to do what needs to be done. Um, so let's just let's talk a little bit then about the future and, and kind of looking ahead and, and you know, what lessons we hope to learn coming out of this. I mean, Congressman Ryan, you, you've been talking about, you know, making this shift and focusing and getting, you know, and using this as an opportunity to really leverage and, and point us into the future. And it, it how, I, I'm, I see you on Facebook Live, I see you on these Twitter events, how 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 can we all help make this transformation happen? Well, I think continuing to do things like this, um, you know, which is why I suggested it. I think now there's an opening. I think people are looking for ways to to deal with the world that is forever changed and will be, uh, in how to really get their bearings and and so continuing to try to promote uh, 
and, and having people. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking like, I don't even have a journal or anything, but I need to start a journal. Like today's the day I've had a general lead me in a mindfulness practice. Like, <laughs> um, it, you know, this is a, this is a special moment to, 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 you know, to continue to promote this. And I really think, you know, it, talking about, again, getting back to the truth and, and saying, look, there's a lot of trauma in the world. It's OK. And it may be OK to say that now because everybody's experiencing it in some way. It's maybe now it's going to be OK for someone to say, hey, how you doing? You're like, I don't know. It's rough, <laughs> you know, and I've had a lot of people who were, you know, tough guys who own businesses. And I just randomly call them uh, and say, hey, how you doing? And you're like, it's rough out there or brutal. Those men in particular, but also women, they would have never said that three months ago, four months ago. How you doing? Fine. Doing good. Hanging in there. You know, all that normal stuff that we do. So there's a there's an opening in our hearts not to get too dramatic about it but there's an opening because we're all experiencing it the same way you know and i wrote in in the book my book healing america um i talked a lot about the greatest generation they had that deep shared suffering that they all went through whether it was the depression then the war and the loss and the death and the and, but it ended up transforming our country in so many ways you know it led to the strong middle class and 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 all of the benefits that came from the new deal and the great society because we were in it together of course we're not going to let our neighbors grandparents go without health care we're going to start medicare of course we're going to you know do social security we're not going to let old people die in poverty you know so the mentality shifted from the roaring 20s um and so our job now is to say, OK, it's our turn. It's our turn to convert suffering into transformation, uh, into compassion and into these things and then create systems in place that healthy food, social and emotional learning. I could give you a long list of how I think that translates into closing right. the digital divide, health care for everybody. You know, we can work on the details of all these things, but those should be the values that convert the pain that we all experience. It was always it's been shared and it will be shared, as I said earlier, for months to come. And then when we come out, if we maintain those values and create an America 2.0 out of that, it could be based on some really deep values around compassion and respect and concern for for others and then build this, the new society off of that. But it starts with things. It starts with meditating with the general. That's where it all starts. Well, thank you, General Pyatt, for, for starting this extraordinary revolution then in that in that case. But I, I do think you're right. I mean, there is because we this is a shared experience. We look back at the greatest generation. My parents grew up during the Depression and boy, did they know how to save money. You know, we grew up eating dented cans and, you know, it's. You know, the, the, the influence, you know, went went for years beyond that. And you're right. This is this is an opportunity for all of us to really reflect on what matters and to look to our right, look to our left and make sure that we're all being lifted up as we as we transition, hopefully, you know, out of out of this lockdown. Let me ask a question, Amishi or Dr. Ja. You know, for people who haven't. Mine <laughs> and. For people who have been practicing mindfulness and maybe they've been inspired by General Pyatt today, um, what is, is it, is it, is it, is it ever too late to learn? Can we learn in the midst of a pandemic? We had a woman, a middle school teacher, uh, send in us, send a question into us on Twitter. She said she had been practicing mindfulness daily in her traditional classroom setting but that now with virtual learning, she's having a difficult time, she said, connecting with her students. So, you know, I know you had been teaching some, teaching my, not you personally, but there had been training with um, troops in pre-deployment. And I know you have a story um, about learning in difficult situations. So can we learn mindfulness in the midst of a difficult situation? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say everything that I would say, anything that I have to say is going to help, in my view, feed the and resource us with our cognitive capacity to do the kind of thing that the congressman just described. I think the main thing that we have now that perhaps wasn't part of the 
previous generations that have dealt with collective suffering is we have an understanding from a brain science point of view that resilience is trainable and that we can actually do something every day on our own that doesn't take an inordinate amount of time to keep us fully able to actually use our minds in the best way possible. And we're going to need that from every single person. You know, uh, Tim was just describing us being off the treadmill. It's like, get off the treadmill, get on the couch and close your eyes for 15 minutes, focus on your breath. I mean, it's a very simple act that will empower us to do what's needed. And yeah, you mentioned this story. So, you know, this story actually motivates me every day. When I get, um, uh, you know, feeling like it's I'm too busy and I can't give 15 minutes to practicing. I remember this particular episode. So this was a project we were doing with active duty Marines and we had trained them before they were deployed to Iraq. This was several years ago now, almost, yeah, more than a decade ago. And there were a group of them that really just resisted us as they were leaving. They're like, this was not for us. We don't really care about anything you have to say. It's a bunch of BS, you know, thanks ma'am. But that was not something we're ever going to we don't, we're glad we never have to see you again, was basically the sentiment <laughs> I was explaining. And, and then they came back and we actually tested them again. And we had this very strange thing happen, which is that their performance on these attention tasks was better after being deployed to a war zone than it was before they left. And I became very perplexed by this. Like, what actually happened? How do you go through even a higher stress situation and your performance is better. So I actually asked uh, our my colleague, my collaborator, who was the trainer, I said, is there anything that stands out about this particular group of guys? I mean, they were totally against us before. And she said, oh yeah, they called me from Iraq and buddies, um, you taught them that stuff that I thought was garbage, <laughs> but I think it's, it's right now. And they started practicing while they were deployed. And that's why we saw the changes that we saw in the positive direction. And I, and I think if, you know, absolutely, if you can decide to learn how to practice in the middle of literal battle, um, a, a lot is possible for all of us. I love that. I'm inspired. I think that's, um, thank you for sharing that story. Drop um, the mic. Drop the mic. It's I over. Know. I know. I know. I'm just trying to do the last question. And it's a hard one to follow after. <laughs> Before I let you go, um, thank you again for setting up this Twitter chat and suggesting it. Um, if, before we go, is there just one thing, if there's one nugget that you want to leave people with um, about mindfulness or about this moment now, Congressman Ryan, what, what would you like to say? I would just, you know, obviously encourage everybody to just try. I mean, we're not here to push anything on anybody, but you got a congressman and a general and athletes and a top neuroscience person. I mean, this is something that that we believe can really be helpful. Um, so, you know, give it a shot and you, you may have an extra few minutes now uh, to do it. But just to leave with this that, you know, it, it's got to be about the truth. Um, we've got to we've got to get a shared sense of what the truth is in this country. And you can only do that when you are really seeing clearly and focusing clearly. And, and if we can have that shared truth that we all suffer, that we all have pain, that we all are going through this, and how can we, I think that will lead to us appreciating each other better, listening to each other. You know, Democrats don't have all the answers. Republicans don't have all the answers. It's usually somewhere in the middle. Uh, and, and the way we think that creates a good solution but we got to start listening to each other. And by slowing down, I think finding what the truths are, sharing facts uh, can help us then move to the next phase of implementing that compassion agenda. You know, I can't keep up with the general with mental push ups and all these other cool phrases he has. So the compassion general, agenda general, take that one. You know, he's reading gloomy. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's well I just want to uh, thank you very much you all have shared a tremendous amount and all of it inspiring and you know even seeing the truth clearly and seeing the difficulty and the suffering that we're in you all have been incredibly inspiring and generous with your time so thank you very very much I appreciate all of you taking the time for this great conversation thank you to everybody in Twitter who took part Keep the conversation going on Twitter You can um, by following along on the hashtag My New Normal. So thank you all very much. Have a super fantastic day. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks, guys. Thank you.